This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. And um, take this moment to introduce Anna Sapolska, Dr. Anna Sapolska, who um, I've known for a good long time. And in fact, we uh, were trying to remember when exactly we met for the first time before we started letting everybody in, but um, could have been... Glasgow, uh, the International Numismatic Congress, um, roughly a dozen years ago, or it could have been my first time to Poland, which was right around that time anyway. But I've I've known her for a, a good while, um, over a decade. Um, and in that time, she finished her PhD at the University of Warsaw um, under the supervision of Alec Bursha, who is a um, very well-known Polish numismatist and archaeologist. And in fact, was our summer seminar visiting scholar back in, uh, I think it was 2015, thereabouts. Um, Anna, since finishing her PhD, um, has taken up a position at the Faculty of Archaeology at the University of Warsaw. And she uh, works on Roman coins with a special focus on coins in context and coins outside of the Roman Empire. In other words, the barbaricum, you know, as it sometimes is known. Um, she has been working on late Roman and early Byzantine solidi finds and Roman gold hoards from the Baltic zone, um, with special focus on solidi imitations and other locally made objects uh, like uh, medallion imitations, Germanic jewelry, and so forth, um, as well as the role of gold in barbarian uh, hands and lands. And she'll be speaking a bit about that today. But one thing I do want to mention. Um, Last year in Warsaw, in September, um, our Polish colleagues hosted the 16th International Numismatic Congress, which was an amazing event. And Anna played a significant role, and um, in my mind, a rather unappreciated or un underappreciated role in organizing that, that amazing Congress. So, you know, I, I just wanna tip my hat again to, to Anna and all of uh, the organization um, that she and our other Polish colleagues did in, in uh, hosting that amazing event. So um, thank you again, Anna. Really had a wonderful, wonderful time in, in Warsaw last year. So with that, I'll, I'll let you speak now. So, um, and uh, turn this off. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Uh... I now will try to uh, share my screen. Oh God, where was it? Ah, here. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Great, that works. Um, so the topic of my today's presentation uh, will be uh, the imitations of uh, late Roman uh, and early Byzantine Solidi. Um, but uh, first, uh, before I go to this, um, I will uh, give you a very broad um, like introduction of what was going on at the time, uh, especially in the Barbaricum and how did it happen that Solidi reached uh, the barbarians' uh, hands uh, since the, let's say, beginning of the fifth century. Already Alexander Bursche noticed uh, that to pay salt, tributaries, ransoms, and other compensations, the Roman emperors used gold uh, or silver coins. But how had these payments happened? Had barbarians received the coins during the Sparsio, that is ritual distribution of coins to the people? Um, or maybe Delectio, that is a bonus payment uh, made to uh, the soldiers, or maybe acting practically, they demanded payment for their service in advance. Leaving, uh, leaving these questions aside, um, I will go uh, to the topic of solidity influx and um, creation of solid imitations. Uh, let me, however, begin with a very general overview of how and when the late Solidi reached the barbarians' hands and lands. Um, how can I? Oh, yeah. Uh, first flow of Solidi to Barbaricum was 
connected to how we can were paid to them as ransoms and tributes. Today's call it's Scandinavian. Um, our in close connection with other finds related to nomadic and East Germanic peoples. The yellow are uh, the blue are Hunnic finds. Um, it is believed that the Huns could control the territories in North uh, by the finds of uh, Jakuszowice or Jędrzechowice settlements here to the um... oh, we seem to have some I think we might have lost her there. Yeah. All right, we will try to reconnect. Um, Oh, I'll oh, there, there, there you are. Anna, we, we lost you for a second there. It looked like a um, problem with the connection. But I, I see you have rejoined. Um, can't hear you. I, I think you're muted, but uh, oh, there we go. All right. Yeah, you're, you're, still, uh, you're still muted. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, there we go. All right, very good. Yeah. Sorry for this. No, uh, it happens. happens. Um, yeah, so uh, um, uh, the single finds of Solidi in Poland are in close connection with uh, other finds related to nomadic and East Germanic peoples. It is believed that the Huns could control the territories north from the Carpathians by settling the client rulers or kings. This might be reflected by the finds of Jakuszowice or Jędrzechowice settlement or a grave for the man of a man with typical Hunnic inventory, but without visible deformations of the skull that could point out to the presence of nomads in Barbaricum. Um, here, what you can see from uh, the, the grave is the sword, amber sword bead, and as well as the buckle typical for nomadic um, uh, tribes. Uh, gold known from the finds from Carpathian Ranch and Danube area is also connected to Hunnic presence and activity. And after uh, 450s, that is the Battle of Nedao and the Catalonian fields, the gold ceased to flow to the north. The smaller wave uh, of Solidi that reached uh, Polish territory can also be linked to what was happening in the Czerniachiv culture area. The topic was discussed um, by Kirill Mezgin uh, lately, uh, but let me shortly mention that several finds known from Poland may reflect migration of Czerniachiv culture people to the north, uh, what was forced by the Huns coming from the east. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of these finds is the deposit, is a cave deposit. Uh, that was uncovered in uh, the so-called Hanging Man Cave in, um, so in the southern Poland in Jura, uh, Kraków, Częstochowa, Jura region. Another find uh, is a hoard um, from Metellin that is closer to the Ukrainian border um, in southeastern Poland that consisted of Binyo of Severus Alexander, um, and several other array, as well as uh, pre Solidi of Constantinus I, Arcadius, and Theodosius. Um, most probably, uh, also the famous and uh, one of the biggest hordes of Solidi uh, from Trompi in Pomerania, Pomer Klein Tromp, also consisted of three um, uh, coins originating from Czerniachiv Horizon. So far, we tend to think that Solidi reached Barbaricum only in the second half or around the mid fifth century. The assumption was based, uh, was made and based on the finds of a horde from Trompki Mawa in Pomerania, but it was made at the time when coins were perceived as missing. Uh, I would then argue that, that the influx of Solidi could have started earlier and the first Solidi finds have to be associated chronologically 
what defines related to nomadic tribes that are dated to around 430 uh, in Poland. And we have to consider that the influx of Solidi had happened at that time and their deposition in Hortz happened around 20 years later, which is not an unknown phenomenon. And, um, so what you can see here, here on the slide are the, the, um, the, the, the earliest coins from the Hort. Um, it looks as though the Hort consisted of three layers of, co of, of coins. Uh, the first uh, was uh, con consisted of Aureus and the 4th century Solidi. Uh, the next uh, layer consisted of Solidi uh, from the Western Mints minted up to Johannes. Um, these coins are a, a bit different to the, to the rest. They are much more worn and often bear uh, graffiti. Um, so the signs of their owners, which, which suggest that they were um, transported as one pool uh, to Barbaricum. Uh, the youngest uh, coins um, comprises of solidi minted by Theodosius uh, II and Valentinianus III, and also later issues of Honorius minted around 430 and 40. So it means that the hot was gathered for at least two or possibly three generations, and it is possible that some of the earlier solidi could have reached Barbaricum before the mid-5th century. Another way of, of gold that reached barbarians was connected to events that took place in Italia uh, and um, with the state uh, formed by the Ostrogoths. It was very thoroughly studied and described by Svantech Fischer, who even tracked from where and in which historical circumstances the gold reached Scandinavia. The Solidi reached Scandinavia, of course, through Polish territory, but necess not necessarily, as Fischer suggested, through Carpathian passes. We lack of later finds from there than issues of Theodosius and Martian. Um, before I will start discussing the more detailed matters concerning the imitations, I would like to point to another topic that is the influx patterns of gold objects within Scandinavia. It is striking, but very clear that Scandinavia was very inhomogeneous in terms of finds of Roman gold. We can define the patterns of distribution of various types of finds. What is more, we can also speculate about the exchange of goods within certain areas uh, in Scandinavia. In Western Scandinavia, that is Denmark and its islands, um, but excluding Bornholm, predominate the solidi of Constantine dynasty. Um, there are a bunch of uh, medallions found, um, as well as solidi pendants. Um, very few imitative medallions come from uh, Western Scandinavia, uh, but what is more, there are uh, the typical items for uh, for western part of Scandinavia are solidly minted um, on one side only, solidly imitations. They uh, they are modeled on western types of solidi, mostly of um, on issues of Julius Nepos. Um, one does not have to add a mass produced uh, bracteats that come from the western part. Of Scandinavia and they probably also origin from that. Only Bornholm stands apart and combines finds typical for both for the whole Scandinavia except for one-sided solidi um, imitations. Um, in Norway the situation looks a bit differently. Uh, Norway yielded only two original Roman medallions and the biggest number of imitations as well as only for solidus pendants. Uh, we can then suppose that uh, it was Norway uh, where the imitative medallions were produced and then distributed within probably gift exchange practice. Um, continental Sweden yielded seven finds of solidi pendants as well as, of, as six 
imitations of medallions and also um, one solidus imitations of Cotlandic origin. No Roman medallions come from that. Um, in Eastern Scandinavia, especially in Gotland, predominate late Roman and early Byzantine, Byzantine solidi finds. There are no medallions and the number of imi medallions imitations is very low. The same applies to solidus pendants. On top of that, only 10% of solidi is pierced, not necessarily over the emperor's head. And I don't need to mention uh, that we know of locally made imitations of solidi from that. It is then uh, clear that the gold finds from Eastern Scandinavia were different to what we know from the Western part. This suggests uh, existing different patterns of influx and also different approach to gold use. Um, this, this is quite an interesting phenomena uh, which is uh, displayed on this map. Uh, we could see on this map that the uh, yellow uh, yellow dots, so medallions, Roman medallions, uh, were brought to Scandinavia from the uh, Roman Empire via Polish territory, um, and that the medallions, uh, original medallions, concentrate mostly in Western Scandinavia. Uh, they then went, were distributed to the north, to Norway, and uh, but not very numerously, and from there, uh, the imitative medallions were um, produced uh, in order to fulfill the gap or the need for uh, gold objects. So let me now uh, present this interesting group of coins that are uh, imitations of Solidi. Uh, this is very a uh, small group of coins uh, that were uh, produced, that was produced most likely on Gotland. It comprises of 24 pieces. Uh, so uh, this is very small in comparison to other objects and only imitations of Roman medallions correspond to this number. The first uh, to approach the problem of, on, of Scandinavian imitations in recent times was Svante Fischer. He divided them into two groups. That is um, the, the first group modeled on Western Solidi, um, which you can see in first two rows, and the uh, pieces modeled on Eastern Solidi, uh, the lower row. Um, he also proposed a chronology of them, suggesting that they were first produced after 476, when Gotland started to be involved in the gold circulation. I will not argue his chronology uh, today. Uh, what I would like to do, uh, however, is to uh, approach uh, the imitations from um, a bit different angle, that is from technological point of view, but first, let me show you uh, the distribution map. Um, so most pieces uh, concentrate on Gotland. Uh, we have only uh, also a bunch of finds on Bornholm. Um, in this case, the dots mark uh, the find spot, not the number of Solidi. And we also have um, several pieces um, out of which only two are preserved from Pomerania uh, in Poland. Um, one imitation was found in Sweden and another one in Jutland, which is uh, slightly um, untypical. Um, so coming to the uh, technology of uh, imitations, um, they comprises of two groups. Uh, that the first one uh, is uh, presented in the first two upper rows, and uh, this group was made um, by using the technique of dye transfer. Uh, the uh, lower two rows comprises of pieces that were made uh, from the dye that was 
cut by a local craftsman. Um, pieces that were made by dye transfer comprise, comprise in most cases of Western issues of Honorius and Valentinianus the first, the third. Um, they were made, they were made, uh, they create a, a group of seven pieces, which were made using three obverse and four reverse dyes. Uh, one imitation is retrograde, but I will show it later. Uh, this possibly may point to their earlier production, but it is hard to prove it basing on the context in which they were found. Pieces that were made from locally produced dye uh, imitates both Eastern and Western types. Um, here, is, here you can see a uh, Another interesting group of imitations. Uh, these were uh, considered to be of Scandinavian origin due to the fact that they share uh, the same dye or dyes. Um, I'm not sure whether these three pieces uh, were made by the dye transfer as it is pretty much corrupted. I tend to think that the dye is of a local uh, production. Um, but since we do not know of such pieces like uh, combining the obverse of Theodosius and Rivers of Martian, I, uh, I was wondering of the origin, whether it is a um, local uh, combination or maybe coming from, um, from somewhere else. And I found such piece on um, Violity, uh, forum. This is a forum for metal detectorists. So it sheds uh, quite a new light on uh, on this issue, and uh, we have to consider that this uh, this uh, imitation could have been uh, produced basing on um, either pseudo imperial issue or uh, other imitation originating either from Danube region or Chernyakhiv culture itself. Uh, we know of um, other coins um, combining these uh, obverse of Theodosius and the rivers of uh, Martian from Scandinavia. Uh, this is the one you can see, uh, which is considered to be Scandinavian of Scandinavian origin is not the only one. Uh, let me now uh, present some Ah, oh, I forgot about this. This is quite a unique imitation. Uh, the, this is the one that comes from uh, northern uh, Jutland, so this western part of Scandinavia. Um, its uniqueness um, is due to the fact that it's first uh, retrograde and um, secondly creates a hybrid. And third, this is modeled on a very rare type of Solidus of Honorius type RIC 1310. Um, I must add that these Solidi are known, as, at least to me, only from three finds. One is um, the Hort of Trompki in Pomerania, the other two are Hordes from uh, Italy, uh, one, I believe, uh, in Rome from Tiber, the other one from the area of Pavia. The rest of coins come from the collections. Um, this imitation uh, was found um, together with D-type bracteats and uh, on top of that, some other two uh, smaller hordes uh, of uh, B and C bracteats were found in the, um, in the vicinity. Uh, so, I think, uh, I believe that this imitation was made um, in um, Western Scandinavia, probably on Jutland. And as you can see, uh, it used to have um, a loop, uh, which have been, uh, has been removed. Um, also, uh, there is a crack in the middle of the coin. So it is possible that um, it wasn't made of pure gold. Um, let me show you 
some other features of SOLID uh, imitations. Um, only four in 24 have holes. Um, as you can see here, not all holes uh, were made above the emperor's head. Uh, one imitation has its hole uh, plugged. It looks as though that some, uh, some of them were aimed for to be displaying on the neck, even though one seems to be pierced from the reverse side. Um, placing holes in other spots uh, than above the emperor's head could have been possibly caused by the need of hanging it, uh, but not necessarily to be displayed, uh, but in order not to lose it. Um, we know of such cases uh, that the holes um, were not made uh, exactly uh, above the emperor's head from other finds uh, of solidi and uh, of array solidi and uh, array imitations. Um, among Scandinavian imitations of solidi, we notice the complete lack of loops. Um, the only exception is uh, the imitation you just uh, saw from Jutland um, that used to have a loop uh, which was removed. Um, but this coin stands apart from the others and its uh, production in the Bracteat environment uh, and in the mirror image on top of that suggests that it rather followed the local pattern of Bracteat or Bracteat-like imitations production. Uh, so in general, we deal here with the picture of the very small group of imitations having no loops, rarely pierced, modeled on rather common types of late Roman solidi and early Byzantine ones. On the other hand, um, we have the solidi pendants uh, at hand uh, that, are, uh, that were much more numerous, uh, but these were however made of rare solidi types. We can then assume that the solidi pendants were made to be singular in terms of the motive, and also to be displayed by hanging it on one's neck. The imitations, however, were made to be unique in terms of their number, the same as medallions imitations, but not necessarily in terms of imitating motive. On quite opposite edge, we uh, may place uh, bracteats together with gold foil pendants and later on gold kuba, which were produced in uh, a mass number. Another feature of uh, imitations is that they create uh, hybrids. The most common is a hybrid of uh, Solidus of Honorius and uh, Valentinianus III. Um, we also know of the hybrid uh, of Theodosius and Rivers of uh, Martian. Um, I wonder whether creating hybrids could have been possibly caused by uh, very few types available of, of the, at the time of their production, uh, that the types that could have served as a model, uh, models, and maybe due to this fact, we uh, should consider that this imita these imitations were made first. If we assume that the hybrid of Theodosius and Martian uh, could be a result of imitating of imitations, we can then conclude that the on, only the Western types created hybrids. Um, some of the uh, imitations also have their re images uh, reversed. Uh, we could, what you could already uh, see, uh, we know of examples that have both sides uh, reversed, Mo more common as reversed only one side. Um, the imitations, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian imitations are heavily uh, dialing. Here you can see um, the first group that were made of dye transfer uh, and their dialings. Um, here another group which is modeled on pseudo imperial Ostrogothic issues, also heavily dialinked and already um, shown group uh, of um, imitations of Theodosius. 
<laughs> Imitations appear in most cases in ports. Um, some of them were also found as a single finds, um, but it looks that uh, they had to circulate or stayed in use for some time, and then they were withdrawn from, from the use, from the circulation, and deposited in the hordes, which have on top of that the latest terminus post quam uh, within the Scandinavia. Um, it seems that the position process uh, of the imitation started earlier or on a born home, but I will come back to this in a minute. So summing up uh, the die chains of uh, imitation within Gotland, we can state that the production of the imitation must have taken place in Gotland due to the number of die chains. Um, imitations could have been produced by one or two lineages uh, that was uh, related within the kinship, which left two biggest Gotlandic courts of Botas and Smith. Um, in my opinion, imitations were rather not meant to be included in the normal circulation. Uh, they were rather distributed or exchanged among the small group, such as fraternity, and probably served as an identification tool or a sort of badge for them. Um, it is quite obvious that the imitations were used for a period of time before their withdrawal from being exchanged in the position. Um, the concentration of, imitation, of imitations in various places within Scandinavia can be linked to circulation of gold, be it of ritual or political character that is gift exchange among Germanic allies. The piece of is known from small Gino in central Pomerania, so in the middle here. Uh, uh, coming from single fine and one from Gotland. Its presence in central Pomerania is related to migration of a group of people that originated probably from Bornholm. Uh, this may be confirmed by a settlement cluster of Scandinavian origin that appeared within the Dempchino group that, and that may be dated to the second half of the 5th century. This corresponds uh, to the period in which the imitations were produced. Probably another such imitation comes from Vitkovo. Oh, these, these are these imitations in the low, uh, lower row. Uh, where according to literary sources, a barbaric imitation was found, but the coin itself is missing. Witkovo is located only six kilometers in the straight line from Smogino and also yielded a cemetery with typical Scandinavian form of graves and inventories. Um, another imitation of Scandinavian origin comes from a hot found on Uznam, uh, Usedom Island in Karshibur. This is this westernmost in Poland uh, imitation. From this hoard, uh, only eight out of around uh, 40 coins are preserved. Uh, among others, the, the imitation uh, mentioned that is die identical to a single find from Gotland registered in Kirkaby that is located in very close vicinity to Botas. So the place where the biggest hoard of Solidi was found on Gotland. A uh, close look at the composition of these two hordes points out that the horde of Karshivur may have been a part of the former. Its presence in Pomerania can therefore be a result of circulation of gold within the gift exchange among, among Germanic allies as well. On top of that, the Karshivur horde may have had a ritual character uh, being deposited close to a seashore in a liminal area. Um, there are several imitations that were found uh, in holds on Bornholm. Uh, these, however, have uh, a bit 
um, earlier terminus post quem than the good lambic ones. So as you can see here, the terminus post quem of these holes are 480, 492, and 500. This suggests that the gift exchange process in which the imitations were included must have started soon after the production of imitations began. Uh, and soon after the Gotland got involved in gold circulation within the Baltic region. It is also clear that the influx of Solidi and imitations to Bornholm from Gotland lasted shorter than to Pomerania and ended up around the year 500. The known hoard containing Scandinavian imitation from Karshibur had slightly later terminus post of 508, 514, and at the same time, it is the latest court of Solidi from Pomerania. We do not know any um, younger coins than Solidi of Anastasius from there. So summing up what I've said about the imitations, uh, the presence of gold in the Baltic Basin resulted, among others, from the process of a gift exchange. It must be underlined that gold that was the subject of this exchange could be obtained in the late antiquity by the barbarians, either through theft or, or through various types of gifts. So leading barbarians' hands were purchased also as a result of ransoms or tributes that fall somewhere in between the gift and theft, so as to say, forced gifts. If we tend to think of Solidi and Roman gold in general, we usually have in mind their presence and role among the Romans. But we should also bear in mind that once they entered the hands of barbarians, their role was automatically transformed. Coins were redefined by them in order to make them usable, at least some of them. So we could notice that coins were variously treated by, uh, by the barbarians. They, for example, bear graffitos, um, like behind the head of Eliaudoxia. Um, they could be reformulated in imitations of medallions. Uh, or reformulated in imitations of Solidi. Uh, they have loops and holes. And last but not least, they were a subject of remelting. Um, we know of uh, very few uh, finds of cut Solidi um, that probably served uh, to make, uh, to produce lo locally made jewelry or brackets or other things. Also thinking of exchanging the Roman gold among the Germanic elites, we should remember that the exchange was not based on gold as commodity. Gold once entered barbarians' hands with an aim to be exchanged among them, lost its identity of commodity even though it could serve as commodity in other circumstances. The exchange was aimed at creating dependencies, alliances, and to evoke the relations of reciprocity. The gold artifacts, that those which were uh, mass-produced, like brackets, possibly gold foil pendants, and also very numerous gold rings, arm rings, and openwork pendants, must fall into category of things that also were redistributed in the form of gift exchange. The same applies for the imitations of medallions, um, of solidi imitations, and one-sided solidi imitations known from the uh, uh, western part of Scandinavia. These were, however, scarce objects. These objects were uncommon, incomparable, unique, singular, and therefore not exchangeable within a normal process and or with the, within the broad, broader uh, social groups. I believe that their exchange must have had different character and the artifacts must have been restricted for a, defin for a defined and rather small social group. 
What is also important that the difference between these mass produced prestige goods and those which were scarce is that the former could have been commoditized and the latter were, were rather precluded from that. Going further, we may assume that this could have played similar role as paraphernalia or of political power or chiefly insignia. Imitations possibly may have expanded the visible reach of sacred power by projecting this power onto the object. There is one more important thing in terms of prestige goods and their production, which is the person of a craftsman. The profession of a goldsmith within late Iron Age societies was very specific. Goldsmiths were perceived in magical categories. They had abilities of influencing the metal that is melting and remelting, so changing their state from solid to liquid and the other way around. So by the uneducated members of the society, they were perceived as a kind of sorcerers. Going farther, they usually lived outside on the outskirts of the society. Uh, what the goldsmith was able to do was to reconstruct the object and give completely new meaning to something that was known as, for example, a Roman solidus. He could change the identity of an artifact and create a new one by making totally different item, yet resembling the original one. Renfrew, when analyzing the use of bronze and the first Bronze Age societies uh, had, has noticed that once a new item appeared within the society, it gains the status of being prestige, prestigious and gets involved in the circulation. This is uh, also true for the medallions, solidity imitations and medallions imitations that I have already shown. In case of medallions that entered Germanic societies in fourth century, we can correlate their circulation with functioning the settlements of central places character, such as Gudma on Funen. The medallions, however, stayed in use, so in circulation, or at least three generations being passed from one owner to the other within the family or kin. As Helle Horsness, uh, argues they could have even changed the role within time. At first, medallions stayed with the realm of men, so warriors or chieftains, and later on were passed to women, as some grave finds suggest. We cannot tell it about solidi imitations. These were rather restricted for men, controlled by men, controlled by men, and collected by them later on to withdraw them from the circulation based on gift exchange process and to deposit them within halls. The reason that their role hasn't changed was probably the fact that they were used for a much shorter period. But what we can tell about both medallions and their imitations and imitative solidity and what deserves a particular underlying uh, is that, that being so scarce, they must have had bigger value than normal solidi or other Roman gold objects. Having in mind that medallions and their imitations, as well as imitative solidi, were so unique and had a special value at the same time, it should be noted that they were also a kind of vehicle to form institutionalized inequality within the society. Their holders could have influenced the society having access to prestige goods on one hand and on the other having access to big amounts of gold that means well. At, at the same time, they were able to provide the rest of the society with everyday needs, but not necessarily reward them with goods of a special value, at least not the whole society, but its higher classes. By the goods of special value, I understand those which were produced in low numbers, like 
uh, medallion imitations and solidi imitations. The rest of gold objects that were mass produced, like Bragdeat, gold foil pendants, jewelry, and other dress ornaments, could have been therefore redistributed among broader group, but still higher social classes. These scarce items were restricted to small groups of possibly warriors and chieftains that went into, into a possession of them, being rewarded by their leaders. Um, let me now shortly summarize the possible reasons of the production of the Solidi imitations. The Roman coins bearing a portrait of an emperor received as payment for services, tributes, ransoms, etc., were most likely perceived as a symbol of power and wealth at the same time, from the obvious reason to be made of gold. The need for identification with this symbol of power could have resulted in the need of creating a unique symbol for the small group that held this power. The imitation could therefore play a role of, a, of the, sim, the symbol or token of this power. The mass-produced items such as brackets or gold rings could have been associated simply with wealth only. Another need, uh, another reason for the production of imitation uh, imitations could have been the need for transformation of a Roman coin in order to give it a new local meaning. So first the coin was deconstructed um, and then reconstructed into a new item but still in the form which resembled the original product. We can also clearly see it nowadays in the form of neck chains with the symbol of a dollar. A dollar is a simply a symbol of money and in broader sense, wealth. The dollar pendant is not a dollar coin uh, that serves as a mean of payment, but it bears a certain message. It can be correlated with wealth and with this wealth, a person could identify him or herself. The need to identify with the wealth is also expressed uh, by the process of counterfeiting the high fashion bags or other prestigious items. The only difference between the solidi imitations and modern imitations of prestigious goods is that the solidi imitations but have been associated with holding and expressing the power and the prestige, uh, the power and the prestige and the imitating the luxurious of goods is associated only with the need of identification with wealth, not necessarily the power. So thank you for your attention. And I thank you very much. That, that was really a very good talk and really fascinating. In fact, um, you know, having done a great deal of work on uh, imitations in the Greek period myself, um, this interpretation of imitation for symbolic and not for monetary purposes is something that I find, you know, really fascinating. Um, it's really uh, something I'm going to have to think, you know, about as well to see, you know, if there are possible you know, parallels or analogies in the Greek world. So really, really fascinating. I, I really like those, well, really like that conclusion. So um, are, are there any questions for Anna about any of this? Uh, James, I, I, it looks like you're asking a question, but you're muted. So if you'd like to... Um, Unmute yourself. Am I there now? There you go. Oh, hi, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So um, you may not like this question because it's a, a little bit off your topic. Um, but can you can you draw any conclusions from the work that you have done <laughs> about the use and circulation of bronze imitations from the same period? Um, actually, I have very little knowledge about that. What I can tell, um, this is something extraordinary. What I found within the imitations from Ukraine uh, is the 
brass imitations that follows uh, the Solidus of Theodosius II. Right. Um, apart from that, I haven't studied the bronze imitations from that period. Oh, we know, however, of some um, fourth century bronze imitations that are uh, present somewhere in the Danube. I saw several pieces uh, in, in the museum in Bulgaria. That's, that seems, that makes sense to me because uh, the volume of bronze imitations seems to begin, seem, seems to massively grow uh, with the with the uh, with the uh, reign of the beginning of the reign of Theodosius. Uh, we seem to have, we seem to have some instability with the connection. Sambian Peninsula. Uh, do I have? Uh, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're back. You're back. We 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 just had a had, had a problem with your connection again for a second there, but I think I didn't hear the the this part of of, of the comment or question. Yeah, we seem to have some uh, instability again. Um, we'll, we'll just wait a moment to see if uh, if it returns. We have ten minutes. Uh, having problems. If you can still hear us, could you maybe hop off and hop back on real quick? I think that just like resets because it, it seems like you have a, the bad connection, so it just might yeah. seem. Yeah, I, I I will leave the. Okay, we'll uh, we'll wait for her to rejoin. Peter, do your musical number we rehearsed for situations like this. <laughs> I'm, right. So we, uh, um, as as it turns out, Anna and I both, or not Anna, Emma and I both have a uh, a fondness for musicals, and um, so sometimes during our uh, lunch break, when we're in the kitchen preparing lunches, uh, we will. Um, uh, sing a little bit from various favorite musicals, and lately it's been Men of La Mancha. <laughs> it's a classic. It is classic. Absolutely classic. So. Okay. All right, Ada, you're back. Am I back? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oof. You're, you're better, better now. Okay. okay. All right. Good. So we didn't actually hear the answer to the last question. I'm not sure if you remember what it was, but you were breaking up during that answer, so. I think I haven't heard the question thoroughly, at least the second part of the question. Well, okay, so very comment. quickly, very quickly, because I don't want to hog this, this whole 10 minutes. It's been my observation that the, the number of imitation bronzes massively increases after 379 after the battle of hadrianople um and and you know it's like a 10 or 20 fold increase i think um but uh, it it sounds like well, it sounds like the material that you're working with possibly has a completely different role um but i'm not sure um, yeah, it looks to me that this is this is completely different matter. Um, actually, I do hope to to get into the bronze imitations as well, um, at least as soon as we can uh, again cooperate with the colleagues uh, based in Kaliningrad, so Russia today. Yeah. Um, because I know of uh, of of a few uh, pieces, but since the material from there is growing the geometric way uh, i can't tell much i only know of the pieces from there and i know uh, it looks as though these are sarmatian imitations so probably also we should uh, get involved in the topic uh, my colleague Kirill Mesin, who knows uh, very well the material from the Chernyakhiv culture area uh, including also moldova 
this 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 um, border uh, region with the empire. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Very good. Do we have any other questions? Um, if uh, just looking to see if there is one. Um, if there's not, I I actually have a another question. Um, and, and I, you, you might have already covered this while I, I had to step out for about five minutes, but has, has there been much metallurgical analysis done on these imitations? Uh, there are actually no um, metrological analyses done, um, but um, since the imitation imitations follow very uh, deeply the, pat the, the, the solidity patterns, so they they are usually around 4. Uh, 4.3, 4.5 grams uh, heavy. Um, I think that they were made simply of uh, remelted solidity, original solidity. Um, mm. There is only uh, one coin that is lighter that, than uh, four grams. This is the coin from uh, Jutland, uh, but this one follows quite a different uh, pattern. Uh, so this is not surprising. And since this coin is crack, it may be a case that this was made not uh, from not pure gold. I saw recently that another imitation is crack and this one, this is, this one is for sure from Gotland or Sweden, uh, but I'm afraid that since these imitations are so scarce that no museum agrees to, <laughs> to make some analyzes. Very good. Any other questions? All right, well, seeing none and seeing nothing in the chat, uh, Anna, I really would like to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. I, I, I know that it's it's getting late on a Friday night in in uh, Poland, and I'm sure that you're anxious to start your weekend. Um, but, uh, <laughs> thank you again so much for for uh, sharing this uh, this presentation with us.